Hello and welcome to... Oh, for God's sake. Starting off the news this week is a story from the very end of last week, just after we finished writing Seven Days of Science, actually. NASA has opened up the OSIRIS-REx capsule containing fragments from the asteroid Bennu and has now released pictures for us to enjoy. Six experts were selected to be a part of the Quick Look team that were first given access to bits of Bennu. Rather fortunately, there were more bits than had been bargained for. Material was also scattered around the collector head, canister lid and base, slowing down the process of fully removing the material in order to properly preserve these extra samples. It is already clear that these fragments from the asteroid show many signs of water and high carbon, which supports the idea that many key materials that make up the Earth were delivered by passing asteroids as it formed. These, in turn, would have been essential in helping life start on this planet. These preliminary observations may be promising, but there's still a lot of work to do and, I'm sure, so many more discoveries to be made with this really remarkable material. NASA Director Bill Nelson summed up what analysing this sample can teach us with this. NASA missions like OSIRIS-REx will improve our understanding of asteroids that could threaten Earth while giving us a glimpse into what lies beyond. In other news, the James Webb Space Telescope has observed the first evidence of quartz in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, detailed in a study published this week in the journal Astrophysical Journal Letters. The planet in question, WASP-17b, orbits an F-type main sequence star about 1,300 light-years away. While it is much larger than Jupiter, it is actually less than half its mass. This massive bit of space fluff is ideal for being viewed from Earth, then, with its very short orbit around its star being another boon in this regard. Particles interesting enough to catch the attention of scientists had before been observed by the Hubble Space Telescope, but those particles being quartz was not something we imagined many of them to have expected. It is thought that these little crystals of quartz are only about 10 nanometers across and take the shape of pointy hexagonal prisms, similar to those found in geodes on Earth. It is believed that, unlike similar mineral particles found on our own planet, these crystals would have actually formed inside the intensely hot but low-pressure atmosphere of WASP-17b. A fantastic discovery from a promising exoplanet then, as the James Webb Space Telescope throws yet more wonderful observations our way. Flying down to the most southern part of the planet now, as a recent study has shown that 71 of Antarctica's 162 ice shelves have reduced in volume over 25 years from 1997 to 2021. 48 of the ice shelves have shrunk by at least 30% and 28 of those have lost more than half of their ice. These ice shelves are all situated on the western side of Antarctica. Those on the eastern side have stayed the same or increased in volume. Scientists calculated that almost 67 trillion metric tons of ice was exported to the ocean which was offset by 59 trillion metric tons of ice being added to the ice shelves, giving us a net loss of 7.5 trillion metric tons. The reason for the difference in melting between the east and the west sides of Antarctica is that the western half is exposed to warm water, which can rapidly erode the ice shelves from below, whereas much of East Antarctica is currently protected from nearby warm water by a band of cold water at the coast. Most ice shelves go through cycles of rapid but short-lived shrinking, then regrow slowly. But the scientists found that almost half of them are shrinking with no sign of recovery. Human-induced global warming is likely to be a key factor in the loss of ice, and ice shelves are now weaker than at any time since at least the 1990s. Scientists are concerned about this, as the addition of fresh water will not only raise sea levels, but also disrupt the ocean circulation system by diluting the salty ocean water. In the Southern Ocean, dense salty water sinks to the ocean floor as part of the global ocean conveyor belt. This sinking of water acts as one of the engines that drives the ocean conveyor belt. As a consequence of the increase in fresh water from melting ice shelves, Deep ocean circulation is declining and the bottom of the oceans are starting to stagnate, changing the deep ocean structure and chemistry. 
First up in the paleontology news for this week, there's been a very interesting paper describing the first direct evidence of cave lions being hunted by hominins. A 48,000 year old cave lion skeleton found in Germany is shown to have various hunting lesions inflicted by Neanderthals, suggesting that these people attacked and killed it with a wooden thrusting spear to the ribcage. There are also various cut marks on other bones indicating that the lion carcass was processed at the site of the kill and then left once enough meat had been taken. The paper also reports on another discovery from a different site in Germany where 190,000 year old cave lion toe bones were found and are interpreted as evidence for the utilization of a cave lion pelt by Neanderthals. There's no polish or wear on the isolated toe bones that might suggest they were being used as pendants or for some kind of clothing. Instead, it seems that they most likely had been attached to a skinned lion pelt that was taken to the site by the Neanderthals, where it may have been used for keeping the hominins warm, or perhaps for other purposes. It's an absolutely fascinating discovery, showing how complex Neanderthals really were. Next up, we've got even more Neanderthal news, again showing that these people were very intelligent and capable of complex behaviours. A paper has been published that describes the formation and patterns of human occupation of a site in central Portugal, a cave where Neanderthals lived between about 100,000 to 70,000 years ago. This locality has been extensively studied for decades, and now this research documents the presence of fires created by the Neanderthal inhabitants throughout the cave. Many hearths were recognised in the cave, with charcoal, stone tools and burnt bones focused around these points. The sediment beneath the hearths had even been reddened by the heat, showing that these fires were still in the place they would have been in when they were made. The burnt bones found here included elements from deer, horses, aurochs, goats, rhinos and even turtles, and the evidence clearly confirms that Neanderthals would regularly create controlled fires in order to cook. Also in the paleontology news for this week is the naming of a new genus of giant pliosaur. Called Lorinosaurus kyleni, it was originally classified as a different genus, Cymolestes, and was found in northeastern France. It's known from most of the lower jaws, four teeth, a fragment of the upper jaw, plus parts of the ribs, the left coracoid, and a couple of elements from the forelimb. The articulated mandibles measure 1.33 meters in total length, so this was a pretty sizable creature. The Pliosaurid dates to the early part of the Middle Jurassic period, which is pretty important as the fossil record of large body Pliosaurs before the late Middle Jurassic had been very scarce. Lorinosaurus therefore shows that the evolution of giant size and robust dentitions among Pliosaurids occurred early on in the Mid Jurassic. It also indicates that the earliest giant Pliosaurids, members of the group called Thalassophenia, meaning sea murderers, were actually feeding on different things to the large Romaliosaurids, another kind of pliosaur group that were dominant in the early Jurassic, meaning they were probably not direct competitors during the time they overlapped, and they also had many differences in skull size and shape. So, Lorinosaurus is a very important new pliosaurid, giving paleontologists an improved insight into how these giant predators evolved, and also showing that the Thassalophonians were the longest living group of marine macro-predatory tetrapods existing for about 80 million years in total. Well, that's it from us for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.